Welcome to Alignment Adventures, a podcast where we explore what it means to live a fulfilling, aligning, and present life. I'm your host, Lindsay Tanner, and I'm so dang glad you're here. Hello, my loves, and welcome back to another episode of Alignment Adventures. I'm so excited to bring you another wonderfully aligning and expansive conversation with Holly Copeland. Now, I know I say that for every conversation, but guys, they just keep getting better and they've all been amazing, but they're just so fun to have these and share them with you all. So Holly Copeland founded the Heart Mind Alchemy. She is a scientist, coach, healing practitioner, and she supports people in their transformation from the trappings of the ordinary mind to flourishing in a life of flow, joy, and ease, which is what we're all about over here. So this is one of the longest conversations I've had on the podcast. And I encourage you, if you haven't checked out my YouTube channel, go and watch the video of this conversation too. I mean, the audio is going to be great, but if you are watching it and listening, I feel like you get the full effect. And if nothing else, just really fill into the resonance of this conversation It just was so flowy and we hit so many expansive topics. I'm not even going to list them all, but to mention a few, we talk about the true nature of ourselves, the true nature of reality, what is consciousness, overcoming our mind stories, bringing together spirituality and science, which is a huge topic that I love to dive into because I think that really helps people get on board with some of the things we talk about. She gives an amazingly powerful meditation right in the middle of it. And she even has meditations on the insight timer app, which I love that app. I've talked about it before. Um, we talk about how it can be difficult to put these things into practice, but how life is truly a meditation and we get to practice these things all the time. We dive into her spiritual awakening and her unique story. And then we talk about how we can really solve all the problems of the world by going within ourselves first, which is such a relieving thought. We can get so caught up in trying to solve all the problems. There's no shortage of problems to solve, but it really starts with us, which is something I've always connected with. But with all that being said, let's go ahead and get into this episode. I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I did. Holly, thank you so much for coming on Alignment Adventures. I'm so honored and appreciative that you took time out of your day to come and speak with us and share your message. Oh, thank you, Lindsay. I'm so excited to be here and and speak to your audience. I know it's going to be a beautiful, aligning and expansive conversation. I can just feel it already. So I'm going to start with my two favorite questions. And the first one, I just feel like is so difficult to answer, not difficult, but people can answer it in so many ways. So I'm so curious to see what you have to say, but who is Holly? <laughs> uh, well, my answer would be there's, there is no Holly fundamentally. <laughs> yeah. Um, because of all the Buddhist studies that I do that there's yeah. a, you know, an illusory self or a character that plays Holly, shall yeah. we say. Um, that ultimately I just, just like every single one of us is just expansive, unlimited, infinite aware and divine awareness. That's all we are, but we are arising in form in the body. Yes. Yes. (laughs) So, uh, that's not to ignore that there isn't a body here that's, you know, but I think like Rupert Spira, one of the teachers I love talks about the, you know, how we arise in form and we're like a dream character in a Mm. dream play. And Mm. that really works for me. Like there's a character here and playing, playing this play. And there's also the infinite awareness, you know, behind it, if you will, although that's a concession to say that, but behind it, that um, isn't confined to the character. I love that answer. I think that's the deepest anyone's ever gone. And I love it. I love deep answers like that. And, you know, the more I've kind of dive, dove into spirituality, you know, kind of dip your toe in at first and then you dive in, I'm like, wow, we really are so much more than we are aware of, especially when it comes to our identity and our ego. So that's why I love answering or asking that question. And that was a beautiful answer. So we're going to pull so many threads on that answer. But before we get into that, 
just in theme with my podcast, I love to ask this right off the bat too, but what does living in alignment mean to you? Ah, okay. So I'll riff on where I started um, with there is no self. And then I'll say that, okay, but as we arise in body, there is, um, there's like a co-creation process going on with the universe. So we have, you know, to me, we, mm, we made a contract or agreed mm -hmm. to come in and to help everybody, you know, awaken, if you will, to, and experience love and relationship. So human beings are in relationship yeah. and we're exchanging what it, you know, consciousness isn't just by my means doing this by accident. We're experiencing um, the nature of reality. We're experiencing what it means to be love in form. Mm -hmm. And so what it means to be in alignment is to kind of step into that truth of why we're here. Mm. and to be really listening all the time and following that truth to the best of our ability. And in my experience, when I stepped into alignment with that truth consciously, then everything just kind of flows in my life. It becomes really effortless mm. in a way. And that to me is the hallmark of living in alignment. Yes. That you just feel like you're in the flow of life. Mm. And it's it becomes joyful and doesn't mean that there aren't sad times or, you know, what we would call sad things that happen, but there's like a, in a way that life, it, it feels like the wind is sort of pushing at your back, propelling you forward. You know, you've got your sails up and you're going. And in that sense, it feels effortless. Mm. I love the word you used flow. Uh, that's one of the reasons I started this podcast is because I agree. I believe that life can flow so beautifully, like the, uh, metaphor we always hear is flowing down the river, but people block that so much for themselves. Like they just can't find that flow and they just see so much suffering and challenge. And like you said, even though we're flowing down the river and, you know, we find that alignment, there are going to be challenges, but how do people like step into that state? How do they kind of break free from this story of life has to be hard and you have to work really hard and step into this kind of flow state? Cause that is really, that's still hard for me. So I know it's hard for other people out there. <laughs> that is sort of the million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> yes. All right. So, um, we have to stop resisting what is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the reason that things feel out of flow is because we're trying to control or grab life and that controlling is what is actually takes us out of flow yes the the lack of resistance to what is puts us back into flow mm. and it can be um, and this is like a moment by moment practice. Like, yeah. what am I resisting? Yeah. Oh, so, like even I'm going to say it like in a small way. So you get up and there's dirty dishes in the sink and that feeling of, ugh, I've got to do that so I can get to the other stuff I have to do is a kind of resisting life as it is. Yeah. You're actually creating the problem of dirty dishes by seeing it that way, right? Yeah. The dishes themselves aren't aren't a problem, right? Hundred yeah. <laughs> like percent. They're just dishes. <laughs> totally. Right? There's nothing wrong with dishes, and there's nothing wrong with dirty dishes. But our mind creates a story that that's a thing we have to finish to get on to some other thing, so our life will be better. And right there, in that very moment, we create the problem because mm. we create a, a subtle resistance to what's happening. And um, if we instead look at the dirty dishes and just be like, oh, okay, this is just what I'm doing right now. And you can turn it. I mean, you know, I did this last night while I was doing the dishes. Like you can be like, I can turn this into a time to think about what I'm going to say on the podcast tomorrow. I can yeah. use that in a positive way, just don't create the problem with what is, you know, yeah. whether it's traffic or somebody cutting you off, 
I think what happens is mostly we're unhappy because we, we create a set up a story that there's something awaiting us in some future moment that things will be better. And we only have to look at like the most simple examples of life to see that we can stop that cycle that we get in right here and right now with anything that's in front of us, laundry, in, you know, dog that has to be walked, uh, whatever, children, in anything. It's just, totally. yeah. It, it reminds me of the episode I did recently because I totally relate to your answer there where I was talking about making the mundane magical because in this experience, in this human experience, we do have a lot of quote unquote mundane tasks and, you know, we get to choose how we see them. And it also reminds me of something my husband always says, but it's so true. Like the only problem is, is we don't have any problems. And it just makes me think of so many different things here, but like, why, why do we have this experience where it's like, we know we are divine and connected to all that is, but then we have this mind that's just like insane and creates all these problems out of nothing. Do you think it's just human conditioning over time? Like, well, why, why do we have this experience that seems so extreme in both ways? Yeah. Another million dollar question. <laughs> I mean, the Tibetans have made an entire study out of this whole practice as have the Hindus yeah. as have Zen, right? Buddhists. So, um, why, so, so we have a mind, my answer would be that we have a mind that, um, is obscuring this nature, this Buddha, Buddha nature, or this open, clear nature that actually is our, our true nature, this divine self. Yeah. And I think what's happened in Western society is that we have not been taught how to use it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like we have, I say in one of my blogs I wrote, it's like we have a Ferrari and somebody handed the four-year-old the keys and said, drive. Totally. <laughs> no idea no no driver's training and we don't know how to operate this mind and you know that's the beauty of I think some of these teachings like the Tibetans is they're actually giving the manual to how to yes. work with the mind um and other like others have done this too but theirs is a beautiful example of the manual to work with the mind and I feel like there should be like Jedi training for four-year-olds that teaches us early on how to see what we are the true being the true self and see yeah. how separate from this little mind story that gets created and what a different world it would be right if somebody taught us at starting at age three or four how to work with our mind I just think we're not taught like most of us don't know and we think that the thinking mind actually and the opposite we're actually pulled away from it with all the conceptual thinking so all the science that's taught mm. all of that well well it's it's a beautiful examination of the world of things and it has a lot of important things that science has done it has convinced us in the objective the reality of the objective world and that thinking is all there is and not to actually step back into the simple as knowing as essence of who we are it really is interesting. I come from a background in education and the more I'm getting into this work, the more I question, why isn't this taught? Like, why is this not a thing? It's just mind boggling. Like you said, you know, we learn math and fractions and all that, but like no classes on how to breathe or how to be aware of your thoughts or how to use your mind. Like you said, for, you know, in a positive way, not such a negative way, because we know we're all guilty and I guess quote unquote victims to our mind and all the stories that it has. So it really is just boggling. And yeah. I know that's a huge part of what you do. You kind of bring together science and spirituality, which I love because I don't know where they got separate. And maybe that was something that was intentional or not intentional. That's another rabbit hole, but I love that you're bringing that together in the work that you do. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, respect science so much in what it has done. And we have some amazing tools, things like this because of the science that we create, you know? Um, and my guess is that 
like, well, at least in the United States, the, 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 because these mind studies, if we'll call them that have largely been done in Buddhism and Hinduism and Zen, we have, we associate that with religion and we have religion of science as Charles Eisenstein likes to point out, which I absolutely love and agree with him on. We have this religion of science that says that never the twain shall meet and we push them apart and think that it's, you know, it's, um, you know, anathema to bring them together or give any cre- credibility to those, you know, Buddhist studies in the mind. And we think that's somehow religion when really it's not. I mean, so much of what the Buddhists have done, for example, have just studied the nature of mind. Yeah. You know, and it's, and then if we take it one step further and we look at the way that materialist science defines consciousness as this thing that's inside the brain that's somehow magically created by the brain, you know, which in fact more and more, you know, quantum science and philosophers like Rupert Spira are pointing to the nature of consciousness is actually the fundamental ground of being upon which matter arises. So we flip them. And we see that actually con- it's a consciousness first universe that yeah. creates matter. And I love the way Rupert Spira talks about it. Um, he says, it's like, you know, at once upon a time we thought the world was flat. And then, you know, we go around ships and we discover the world's not flat. And then we think the earth revolves, uh, um, or the sun revolves around the earth. And then we get you know, telescopes and we recognize the sun doesn't revolve around the earth, you know? And so one by one, we kind of prove that it's not a flat earth and the earth revolves around the sun. And the, the analogy today is we think that consciousness is created in the brain and all yet all of this, this quantum science and this, the pointings to by, by leading teachers like him are saying, no, actually, it's a consciousness first universe, and there isn't such a thing as matter. And wow. I think when we get to that point where we actually finally, like collectively, that becomes our new truth, then everything will change. Mm-hmm. Our whole Western science world is predicated on this one assumption that consciousness mm-hmm. is something created in the mind. Uh, that it's mind blowing. I mean, no pun there, but <laughs> it really is mind blowing to think that everything comes from consciousness. And I feel like that is such a hard word for people to define, like what is consciousness? So like <clears throat> one, how would you define consciousness? And two, how can we use like that information that you just told us, which like you almost just have to sit and meditate on because you're like, wait, what, how can we use that to like better our lives? And to live more in alignment and to be happier and to live life in flow. Yeah, it's such a great question. Um, let's see. So what is consciousness? I mean, conscious, the way that I'm using it is yeah. that it's actually everything that is. So just, so, you know, your experience of awareness, like before you do, and, 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 and I'll actually maybe use this as a pointing to answer your second question, which is how do we use it to better our lives? So if we just start by the premise, this will be a little bit of a meditation, if you don't mind. Yeah, totally. Okay. Love it. Great. So, so actually I'll invite everybody to close their eyes unless mm. you're driving mm-hmm. <laughs> and then just gaze and you can follow along. Mm-hmm. Notice that before you do anything, I am aware. So oh, you awareness are here before any object, but meaning any thought or feeling or sensation arises, there is something aware of all that we call awareness that is not something you can't get rid of or will ever go away. And so I'll just ask you, Lindsay, does this feel true that awareness is here without your help? It's not, you can't make it go away. Yes. And does it feel as though it's always been here and always will be here? Yes. 
So we, we start with this basic understanding. So just feel into this right now. You awareness are not, there's nothing that a small self that you might call Lindsay or Holly is doing to create this. This is before any of that. Does it feel that way? Yeah, totally. Like something that's just been there in the background that we just overlook. Exactly. So we're kind of bringing this background into the foreground a little bit and just looking at the qualities of it. And we sit and we notice that it's everywhere. So I'll ask you, can you find an edge to your awareness in any direction? Mm, no, it's like a, like a cloud, but one that doesn't really have an end, just kind of like dissolves. Yeah, exactly. So like if, if we all right now just prove this to ourselves by taking your awareness up into space above your head and see, like, can you find an edge to the awareness? And if you think you found an edge, just pour space into space until you're convinced that there's no stop. There's nothing outside of awareness that you yourself notice. Does that feel true? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in this, we can see our firsthand experience that awareness is infinite. And we talked a little bit before that, that it's timeless. It's always been here and always will be here. She said was also your experience. So it's like this background or the screen of all experience upon which this movie we call life is playing. And one essential way that you can work with this is to notice that no thought you've ever had has stayed in awareness. Mm. So I'll ask you, does, is that true? Has any thought you've ever had stayed in awareness? No, it will, it will come back up here and there, but it doesn't stay continuously. No. Right. So that's beautiful realization because that means that if you have an angry thought arise or a judgmental or a negative thought, you know that it's not going to stay because it's not, there is no such thing as a permanent thought. The only thing that actually stays is you awareness. So that's a really important seeing that awareness is this stable, unchanging element in all experience. It's not moving like the thinking mind. Mm -hmm. So I call this, it's like the stable ground of our being because it's here for us no matter what. And notice another important quality of awareness. So it's timeless and infinite, but also does awareness have any opinions about what's happening? <laughs> no. No. So it's, it's, um, it's sort of agnostic to what's playing on the movie screen, right? Mm -hmm. So it could be actually a really difficult movie. It could be a horror picture show. But awareness is just aware. It doesn't have any opinions. So in that way, it's almost like this amazing friend that you have because it can be with whatever's happening no matter what movie's playing. It's always stable and unchanging in here. And it may feel a little esoteric if a really scary movie's playing. Often it, it like obscures the screen. It's so loud that we just feel like we're bound in sadness or bound in hurt or something like that. Mm -hmm. But even just a small movement to notice, am I the hurt or am I the one that's aware of the hurt? 
Can you pause for even just a moment and long enough to notice that it's just something you're aware of? And taking it one step further, if we aren't the hurt, and if the hurt is something we're aware of, then that awareness that's open and infinite and unchanging is actually okay. Kind of no matter what's playing on the screen. Does it feel that that's true? Yes, totally. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, yeah, go ahead. This feels so good. It's so, it's just like calm, so calm. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So to me, this essential realization is which is I think the most important first step we can have into awakening to who we are is this knowledge that we're always and already okay no matter what's happening in our lives that no one can touch this And when you realize that, when you realize that this goodness, this space of well-being actually is your essential nature, is what you are, that can't be taken away from you, then there's like an invincibility that you develop to whatever's happening in the outside world. You don't need to solve the problem of the person who's angry at you because this well-being can just you it's like you take up it's like you it's like you're a, a snail and you get a new home and this home is like the always whole and perfect and complete home mm -hmm. and it becomes like like a shell but it's not it's permeable to everything in life that just is okay and that's like that's resilience that's the that's to me the well being and happiness that everybody, the peace that everybody is looking for. Mm. It's actually always available and always here. That's what the Buddhists were pointing to. And oh, maybe you just, and you and all the listeners just touched into this for just a little bit. In that sense, it's like not any more complicated than that. Like spirituality doesn't actually have to be any more complicated than what I just pointed to, to fundamentally and radically change your life. And all you need to do is just keep practicing, returning to the whole of your being, this okay place where you know you, you really are okay, no matter what. And if we keep coming back and we keep coming back, we stop getting pulled out into the experience of the world of things and it's just something we're aware of we can actually learn to stay in this okay place all the time and then you're awake yeah so when you're ready i'll just invite you to open your eyes and anything you want to share about that mm. holly thank you so much that i needed that <laughs> <laughs> and that felt so good and it was such a great reminder even though i talk about this stuff all the time like i get i'm a human too and i get so caught up in the stories and they they truly are just stories and just that simple practice reminds us of what we are and you can't there's no one that can deny all the things that you just explained like we are awareness at our core and even at the end there like it's it was getting a little trippy almost I was like okay <laughs> I should probably open my eyes so I can continue this podcast but that's what people are talking about with meditation and I feel like that is a word that kind of scares people sometimes because they don't know how to do it or what they're doing but that was that was it right there. And you made it so simple. So do you have any other tips on like how to tap into that 
more throughout our day when we're, you know, dealing with the stress and the stories that come up, they're not really problems, but we make them problems. Yeah. Um, I have, yeah, sure. I have lots of tips. Um, and I'm doing an Instagram right now of like 365 days to become unshakable. And I just give these tips every on most days. Um, so people can tune into that. Well, for sure. Share that. I need that. So we'll share that for sure. <laughs> um, but you know, here's another tip, you know, because our eyes, we focus on things and our eyes kind of draw us out and they get us pinpointed, which gets us trapped into this conceptual mind that needs to think about things. And we kind of get sucked back into the world of, of an identity. Mm-hmm. You know, so here's a tip, just notice the space right now between you and the, I mean, the computer screen mm. and you. So rather than focusing on me or the element, just focus on the space. Mm. <laughs> and then if you want, you can bring that space into the space behind your eyes. Mm. And then just notice that there's just space. There's something about focusing on the space that just brings actual space into the mind. Mm -hmm. We are like whatever we're thinking and it is arising, we kind of become it in a funny way. So if we just bring space as a new element into the mind magically, actually we become that. And it has this way of like dissolving, like it feels like the little thoughts they kind of go boo, 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 boo. they sort of just disappear totally yeah you can't when you're focusing on the space like that you can't think about your to-do list or yeah. what someone said to you yesterday or insecurities or whatever like you yeah. you're thinking about the space and there's really no room for anything else yeah and it makes me think too like connecting it to science I used to be a science teacher actually and I always loved showing that video of like the atom which we're still probably learning so much about the atom but how it's mostly empty space so like the irony of it all too is matter is really space space (laughs) (laughs) yep and the buddhists say this too I'm I'm working on a book right now and I was just reading this earlier so this is why it's very much on my mind like the nature of mind is empty and is luminous and space that's what they say wow so um yeah so that's one Mm -hmm. another one that i brought up that gets a little bit back to the doing the dishes that we talked about it's just this phrase stuck with me long ago and i think about it how you do anything is how you do everything Mm -hmm. That's powerful, you know? And so when we're rushing to finish an email or, you know, get through something, remember that that how you do anything is how you do everything. So if you bring joy to answering an email, that actually becomes your lived state. Mm you know, outside of doing it, you are, you are that. So it really matters how we do, as you said, you know, the magic of, of sort of no ordinary moments of yeah, focusing on all the little things. Um, but I do think that making some of these practices, like practicing them many times throughout the day, you know, is essential. Like for me, like life is the meditation. I'm, I'm never not Mm. practicing, you know, do I get pulled out? Yeah, it happens, but I'm always in a state of returning back to the practice. Mm. Makes sense. I love that because that's kind of where I've been finding myself recently. Well, my life, my reality has changed. I just had a baby like a few months ago. So (laughs) thank you. Yeah. Huge change. But that's something I think about a lot is I'm just always in the like robot do mode of like, okay, I got to do this. And then I got to do that. Like that's mom life, right? You just think of like all the things you have to do instead of focusing 
and what I'm doing in that moment and bringing all my awareness to what I'm doing in that moment. Cause like you said, I mean, in so many philosophers and spiritual teachers have said, all we have is the present moment and that's where the magic lies. And I just find it so interesting how, even though I love this stuff and I feel like I digest so much of it, it's still so hard for my mind. Sometimes, like you said, life is the meditation. And I, I needed to hear that meditation or that message right there. (laughs) Like we're practicing this day in, day out, every second of our life to come back to just the simplicity of life. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm very sympathetic to what you're saying because I very much feel that like how, how easy it is to get caught in Mm -hmm feeling like you're going from changing diapers as I'm, I'm was, <laughs> my kids are 18 now, but I was a mom of twins. I am a mom of twins, <laughs> Yeah, uh, but I was a mom of infants and it, you can get caught feeling like when I just finish the dishes or do the change the diapers or whatever. And for me, a cut through phrase that I work with all the time is there's nowhere to go. Hmm. Mm you're not going anywhere none of us are going anywhere Mm -hmm. if we just remember it's like if we just give up trying to go anywhere then like oh all right I'm not going anywhere so maybe I'll just look at my daughter's little feet or you know I'll just like just like feel the soap on my hands or feel the warm water before you wake up in the morning like feel the sheets Mm -hmm. I did this morning just like ooh, the bed feels good Mm. I don't know it's just but it but that phrase and that remembrance that there's nowhere to go there really isn't that makes me think like how much we take for granted just our five senses or there's probably so many more than that (laughs) but like the known senses like what does this feel like what do I feel right now on my skin or what do I smell what do I see yeah. We just kind of get into that mode of, yeah, just getting caught up in so many things. We forget to just live through those senses, which is a question I'm always trying to answer. Like, like why are we here? <laughs> Big question. <laughs> <laughs> but that feels like resonant for me. We came here to lay in our bed and, you know, have it feel amazing to have those experiences, those human experiences that you probably can't have when you're not in your body, you're in the non-physical or whatever it is. Right. When you're in a different dimension, you know, yeah. other dimension, you know, like we're at this one unique dimension of the, the physical world. Exactly. And actually when we feel through our senses, that drops us into the present moment. It's mm-hmm. actually only the mind that creates a story that there's mm-hmm. a future or a past, like that's all created in the mind. And so the way, a way out of that is just to go back into, you can only you know, feel the sheets in the moment, you yeah. know? So just, you know, do like use the senses as the doorway into actually just being here. Uh, that's what this conversation has really felt like. We're, I'm just like here and it feels so good, but I do have a few more questions for you. Um, yeah. And they seem like they're backtracking, but I'm just very curious. Like, I know you haven't always been on are doing this, what you're doing right now, you've had other careers, other lives, I guess you could say. So when do you feel like you really kind of had this realization that there's more to this reality? Or do do you feel like you always did, like even from a young age? I did always from a young age. I started exploring spirituality, you know, when I was in my teens. And I even asked the who am I question when I was seven. I had like a no when I asked it. I turned Uh in the car and I was like, who am I? Mom, who am I? I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm been a seeker in that sense my whole life, but I, but I, um, I had, so I was a scientist for the nature conservancy and the mm-hmm. university of Wyoming is a full career up until four years ago. And, um, and I kind of put those spiritual things, even though I would listen to, you know, I would listen to podcasts or I would, you know, read Oprah, um, you know, uh, Eckhart Tolle or something like that. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a really deep meditation practice and fully dive down the rabbit hole until about four years ago. 
where I got really serious because I recognized that I'd been kind of, I problem was I checked all the boxes. You're smart. You're doing this now, but I checked all the boxes. Like I had a dream job and a, you know, two beautiful children and a loving husband and a nice house in a small community. And I still wasn't happy. And I had this despair about the planet, like the existential crisis, mm. all of what we're doing to the earth, just as my job as a professional working in that field, I just was deeply worried and deeply kind of in despair for the planet. And I just had to figure out a way. I was like, I can't possibly do it. They're like, there are no more boxes to check. Something's wrong. And is this the, how it's going to be? And I felt mm. life was just this groundhog day of a rabbit hole of like waking up and then doing it again and waking up and doing it again and waking up and doing it again. And I had to get off the rabbit, you know, the hamster wheel. I just was like, no more. I, I need to know what's really happening. Wow. Do you think nowadays, like that's happening, you know, that can happen at any point in our lifetime here on earth. Do you feel like that's starting to happen at earlier stages for people? It does seem like that. It seems like, you know, and because of the quantum field, we're all connected. So the more people that start to explore this and wake mm -hmm. up to that, you know, understanding and really want to dive into that, I think we're, we're teaching each other, you know, I'm mm -hmm. teaching you and you're teaching me mm -hmm. and everybody listening, we're all teaching each other mm -hmm. and we are actually creating a resonance and a vibration, a coherence as heart math is measured mm. of greater coherence on the planet of people all waking up for lack of a better word together. So I do, I think it's accelerating. Mm -hmm. uh, that even does though, give us know, hope. <laughs> yeah, even though the, there's a lot of apparent pain in the world. Totally. But, but my experience is, and my belief is that that all of that pain is sort of like the last cry of the material world to open to something much greater and bigger and what we really are. Totally. You said that, you know, and I've talked about it too, with the heart math Institute, like we can measure these things. It's easy to get lost in like you were worried about global warming and, you know, a lot of the environmental issues, but I know a lot of your work deals with starting with that and shift internally. So you've kind of already mentioned this, but instead of getting overwhelmed with how can we fix all the problems of the earth, like global warming and all that, does it truly start within us? Yeah. Thank you for asking that question. So that's what I fundamentally, all of my searching led me there that this wasn't a problem. I had to stop trying to fix the outside world. And I actually gave myself permission. I was like, I'm just going to take a year and I'm not going to watch the news and I'm going to try to fix me and I'm going to see what happens. Mm -hmm. And, um, and where that led and the understanding I have now is that that's exactly what each of us needs to do. It's not that we, it's not that we will, the way I see it is it's like a put on your own oxygen mass first problem. Like the plane is yeah. going down and we each need to put on our own oxygen mask so that we can be recognize the fundamental goodness and love of our own heart and being come back to this knowing that we're whole come back to our own joy inner joy like give ourselves permission to really feel the goodness and love that we are mm -hmm. and like really find that like not that we need to you know we don't need to have a latte to feel that we didn't need to eat ice cream to feel that or mm -hmm. go on a trip to feel that like we feel intrinsically like that we're good and mm -hmm. worthy and whole and and that when we discover each of us discovers that for ourselves we source this infinite capacity this like we're sourcing the perfection of the divine really and then it's like the whole world what happened to me was like, it's like putting rose colored glasses on yeah. like the whole world, like all of a sudden looks brighter. And then you have this infinite capacity 
to help everyone. It's like, you can breathe now. I've got the oxygen mask on, I can breathe. Now I can be the firefighter and I can run into the building to help others mm. because I feel whole and complete. Mm -hmm. I was trying to do before was I was injured and my leg was broken and you know my arm was falling off and I was trying to be a conservation scientist. And that's why I wasn't you know, feeling good doing it. So I absolutely think this is an inner journey for everyone to find their own wholeness and to give yourself permission to do that and seek the support of others. And there's so many teachings out there now. And mm. oh my gosh, it's amazing what's available, but give yourself permission to do that and kind of let go of the need to fix the outside world. Mm. It actually, you will, you will source infinite capacity to help the planet once you feel whole. Mm. That feels very, very resonant for me, even because, you know, the mind loves logic and we have a lot of minds listening, even with what you said of like, how much do we consume to try to fill those voids when really we can just go within ourselves find that whatever we're seeking for is within us already. Like you said, nothing that we can consume or buy is going to give us what we don't already have. That right there is going to help the earth, you know, because we're going to be consuming less things. So from a practical standpoint, it really is a matter of just doing the inner work, which is so beautiful and reassuring and like, okay, like I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, it, really we just need permission to and i think permission to to feel pleasure i think there's a i was caught in a trap of like feeling guilty mm. because if because of how much other people were suffering or the planet was suffering and so like oh i'm it's not okay to be really boundlessly happy because so many people are suffering like that's a guilt story that you're caught mm -hmm. in um, and actually like my model is the Dalai Lama. Look at him. He's like this joyful being mm. who, who on earth could be more aware of pain and suffering than the Dalai Lama who was kicked out of his country. And, you know, his people were, you know, tortured and enslaved, like somebody who knows the absolute reality of the, you know, sort of evil of humanity. And yet what he brings is boundless love and compassion. Mm. So really what we're doing is we're like finding our own inner compassion, compassion and love and giving ourselves permission to like, to like feel the juiciness and love of life. Like it's an amazing world. Like it's so beautiful. Mm. You know, the hummingbirds coming to my humming feeder, they're beautiful. Mm. And, but when you're caught in despair, it's like, you can't even feel the beauty of the trees or the flowers in front of your house. Cause it just sort of to, I'll speak from my own experience. It felt like there was like kind of a gray film over the world. Like, yeah, but how could I be happy when people in Ukraine are suffering? I don't even give myself permission. And this understanding cuts through all that and allows you to, to come back to the infinite goodness. Like you really are okay. You really are beautiful, boundless being. And then like, look how much you have to give when your cup is overflowing, mm -hmm. you know, and radiating like the Dalai Lama's, like, look at how much compassion and love he has to give to everyone around him. And look how much that benefits humanity by having somebody like that, you know, radiating love and compassion. So I just look to him and I go, yeah, that's what I want to be in for the mm -hmm. people in my life. I just want to radiate love and compassion and I know that that will help far more than any other getting bummed out about, you know, whatever the next thing you read in the newspaper. So, you know, it's that, and that's a practice to learn to, that's the, that's the deep work to cut through and what's, and it can be as simple as what we just did earlier mm -hmm. mm. to start. It's amazing. And yeah, that feels so good. I struggle with guilt a lot too. And it makes me think like, you can't, what good comes from guilt? You being guilty doesn't make those people happier. It doesn't take their suffering away. You know, that's the paradox of it all. Like you finding your alignment, your happiness, your, you know, that connection within is going to help you 
help the other people. So thank you for that reminder. I want to respect your time. So I'm going to ask you these last few questions. I know you have uh, your heart, mind, alchemy that you founded. So how can people work with you there? What do you do in that container? Like, what are some specific things that people can come to you for? Because I know this conversation has just felt so good. So <laughs> people are going to want more. <laughs> Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah. So I, um, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching and I have a program I call awaken, heal, breathe and mm -hmm. work with people one-on-one. -on -one. And I do you know, a lot of guidance, like we just did to help people, you know, anchor in this well-being, find their way to an anchor for themselves that they can keep, that they know where that is and keep returning to mm -hmm. so that it becomes their ground. I also do healing with tuning forks and breath work mm -hmm. as part of that program. And part of the work I do, I do biofield tuning. Um, and I've found that work like even if when we have the realization of our infinite boundless awareness, there can still be the vibration of guilt and judgment that keeps pulling us back there. And that vibrational tools like tuning forks or breath work are amazing to help like uh, retune our bodies mm -hmm. out of those, those vibrations. Um, and, and then, so I do individual biofield tuning sessions. If you just want to try it out, I do that, but I do my core program as this coaching program with a package of sessions to help people get there. And then, um, I'm teaching workshops now, um, got one called vibrational alchemy that I've actually got coming up next month. And, um, you get two, three tuning forks in the mail and an essential oil. And I teach you daily tools to use the tuning forks on your body daily to help bring your vibration, you know, bring yourself out of tune or into tune from being mm. out. Of tune. Um, and that's, you can find out that on my website. And then if you're in Northern California, I'm just starting to lead to guide group breathwork sessions in this, these experiences I call the awaken, heal, breathe experience. Uh, at Padma Studio in Fairfax, uh, California, which I'm really excited about. Mm -hmm. So those are my core offerings. Yeah. Oh, oh, and last one, guided meditations I have on Insight Timer. Oh. So if you're an Insight Timer person, you can find me as a teacher there. And like the meditation I guided today, you can find a whole bunch of meditations like that on my Insight Timer channel. I love Insight Timer. I've talked about that before. So that is so cool. You have meditations on there. And I wish I was closer to, well, I'm close to California, Arizona, but I wish I was closer to come to your breathwork sessions. That sounds amazing. And I just want to remind people, this is another thing that's been in my awareness is like the embodiment piece, like the physical part of it. So like the tuning forks and the breath work and, you know, yoga, whatever it is, like you have to have some kind of practice that helps you like embody it in your body because our body is so smart it is like a vessel and we it communicates with us so I think that's beautiful work that you're doing with people yeah so wise I 100% agree with you it communicates with us the body and it's in, so wise and intelligent totally yes. and so yeah those somatic tools I think are really really helpful to me it's like a marriage or a union of the the meditative pointing out instructions for how we recognize that we're not our thoughts married with the, the releasing of all that energetic, you know, guilt and shame and judgment that we've stored up in the energetic body. For um, sure. We're dimensional beings. Mm -hmm. We got to do all the aspects, <laughs> mind, <Yes>. body, soul. <laughs> exactly. 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 So my last two questions are, <clears throat> I've loved asking this one to people, but what is like one of your favorite alignment activities recently that you just love doing that just brings you so much joy? Oh, alignment activities. Well, I will say I went to a concert um, on at a coffee shop in San Francisco on Wednesday. I love listening to live music. So I'm going to say that one, you know, in this case, I was listening to Pia. If anybody's listening, Pia is an amazing musician and uh, she does kind of like Celtic, beautiful melodies and touring with somebody named Andrew Finn McGill and who's a violinist and together they were astonishing. So, yeah, I really like, I'm a very vibrational person. So for mm -hmm. me, like, or sound baths, like bathing in the, 
in those vibrations and receiving them either through beautiful music or sound baths. I, I those are some of my favorites. Mm. How about you? Can I ask you that question? <laughs> well, you're reminding me how much I love concerts, which I'm like, that's probably not going to happen anytime soon. Cause I can't take a baby to, a well, I guess you could, I don't know, maybe get a headphones or something. Um, what have I been loving recently? You know what I've been doing? I've been reading, I've been going to the library, which I like, feel like our society's forgotten about the library. There are oh. three books <laughs> available oh, to yeah. us. So true. Yes. <laughs> and I want to go and like get all the books because it's free, but I'm like, Lindsay, you don't have that much time, but I've been reading a book on like astrology, which is something that mm. I like know about, but I, I've never been super connected to until recently. Like it's just felt like something I should dive into. So that's been aligning for me. And then I'll put like a coffee shop ambiance on YouTube because I live in Arizona and it's not fall. We don't get fall. So I'll have like a fall ambiance and read my book and it just feels so good. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. And I, I want to put in a word for astrology. I've actually been studying it with, for the last year with a teacher and it's amazing. Like it blew my mind. Um, and coming from the scientific mind, it's like, there's a whole science of astrology. If you can drop the the, all the disbelief stuff or the, like the idea that, oh my God, how could that possibly be true? And actually just start studying what is in the science of astrology. It's amazing. And it'll blow your mind. There's so much to it. Like, I just always thought you just had your sign, but yeah. there's like a whole thing. Like it's a map of your life. It's yeah. an actual map of your life. When, now that I understand it, I can look at a chart and it's like, you can see everything about a person. It's so cool. It's so cool. I hundred percent. My only problem right now is I can't figure out the exact time that I was born and I've been trying to search online. Oh. I'm going to find it somewhere, <laughs> but that is like a key piece. <laughs> so if you're interested in this, make sure you know when you're born. Yeah. Yeah. And then my last question for you is just like, what's one piece of advice you would give to someone just starting on this journey of like realization and, you know, finding their awareness. Yeah. Get a teacher. Mm. You know, I did a lot of this work by myself on my own reading books for a long time. And there was, and I heard somebody else give that advice. And, and I hundred percent agree when I took a course and the, one of those teachers became my primary teacher, but I was connected to still both of them today. It changed everything to have a mentor guide in this realm in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say, if you're like, well, how am I going to find that? Like, just ask the universe, like say universe, I am ready for a teacher, bring me a teacher. And one, if you keep asking one will show up, you'll know. I love that because I agree when things really started to change for me, it was when I like kind of dove into a course of this kind of stuff and like immerse myself. Mm -hmm. So that is beautiful advice. So Holly, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. And for that beautiful meditation, I'm going to go back and listen to it <laughs> when I need that reminder. And just thank you for sharing your message. It, it was so much fun. Oh, you're so welcome. I love this. This was so much fun to be here. So thank you for the invitation, Lindsay. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. It's just been a joy to be here. Holly, again, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I just think she is so well-spoken and can articulate these things so well. And she shared so much wisdom. So if you're interested in connecting with Holly, which I know, I'm definitely going to dive into some of her resources, especially her insight timer meditations and probably her tuning work offerings, because that sounds like something I really need in this time and space. You can connect with her at heartmindalchemy.com, or you can find her on Instagram at Holly Aaron Copeland. So I will link everything in the show notes for her. Please share any takeaways that you have with her or with myself on Instagram. My handles at Lindsay with an A M Tanner, or you can follow along with the podcast. I share quotes and highlights on that Instagram, but they are linked together. Alignment Adventures podcast on Instagram. And please share this episode with anyone that you think needs to hear this message, especially that meditation at the end. That was just 
so powerful. I'm sending so much love and so many high vibes to every single one of you. If you are new here, please subscribe to the podcast. We have new episodes every Monday. I love sharing these concepts with you all, whether it's a solo episode or an expansive interview like this one, and they are going to keep coming. There's no shortage of what's coming up for you guys. So please subscribe if you're new here. And of course, I will see you next Monday on Alignment Adventures.